anti-racism can't be a matter of changing individuals. It has to be about dismantling structures of power. You give your immigration officer all the diversity awareness training you want, they're still going to deport you. They'll just deport you politely, right? If we don't make a clear distinction between liberal anti-racism and the more radical alternatives, we hand to conservatives an easy attack line. They're right in a way that liberal anti-racism is kind of patronizing, right? It does look down on on people as uneducated, it looks down on people who on lower incomes as somehow more likely to be racist and so on, right? While ignoring the you know the very powerful people who who maintain a racially divided world. Hi, my name is Kojo Karam and I'm blessed to be in conversation here today with Aaron Kundanani about his new book, What is Anti-Racism and Why It Means Anti-Capitalism. Thank you for joining me, Arun. Uh, good to be here, Kojo. Well about this fantastic book, um, I think the starting point that I want to ask you about is why you seem to have such a problem with all of these fantastic new corporate opportunities that the anti-racist boom has offered up. Um, you know, over the last five or so years, there's been this eruption of interest in anti-racism and people have been able to get jobs at Fortune 500 companies, people have been able to get corporate sponsorship deals. And why do you think that that's bad? Why should I not have my Nike deal? Right. Well... Yeah, so you know the the sort of starting point for the book is is the Black Lives Matter protests that happened in the summer of 2020, um, when we had in the United States something like 15 million people on the streets, um, and um, you know people were coming out for all kinds of different reasons, but the, the sort of central demands really from that moment were, you know, defund the police, uh, abolish the immigration and customs enforcement. Um, uh, shut down prisons and so on, right? And and so what the the kind of politics of of what was happening on the streets looked like was um, not about trying to get police officers and corrections officers and immigration officers to kind of do their job better, to kind of root out the bad apples, um, to get the to get the, the the workforces more diverse, but to actually reduce the power of those institutions and, and remove their capacity to inflict violence. Um, and, um, and, and, it, and it was, so it was a, you know, about basically dismantling these infrastructures of violence um, that were understood to be central to the way racism works in the United States. And, um, and then if you look at how that, that moment was taken up in, in the kind of liberal institutions of the United States, in the universities, in the corporations, um, uh, and so on, the human resources departments across the country, it was a very different kind of story. Um, it was about, you know, what can we do to, to tackle our unconscious biases? It was about um, how can we increase diversity in, in terms of representation at senior levels in organizations. Um, and um, so one definition of what anti-racism might look like had been substituted for another. And although, um, you know the CEOs who 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 through that summer talked about things like systemic racism or structural racism. Actually, they didn't have a concept of structural racism. What they were really talking about was um, a liberal anti-racism of how do we change the attitudes in our head, um, change our unconscious biases um, at the level of individuals, rather than thinking about what are the structures in society um, that um, generate these systematic outcomes. Um, so, you know, so the book starts from that moment and tries to think through, well, where do these, if we, if we understand that really here, there's two kinds of anti-racism, there's a liberal one and a radical one. The radical one was what was on the streets in that summer. The book tries to tell a story of where those two forms of anti-racism come from and, and, and the, the kind of separate stories that, that, um, reach back through the 20th century. Brilliant, brilliant. And I think one thing that's really important to emphasise is that in telling that kind of history of particularly the radical form of anti-racism that you, you know, champion in the book, I think you also tell a kind of um, alternative history almost of the 20th century, but one that really centres what happened in the Global South, the anti-colonial movements, and particularly the, um, the struggles of what then became known as the Third World in the 1970s. Why do you think that that history is so important for us understanding the way that our world works, even in 2023? Yeah, so I think if you look at um, where our struggles have been in the last 10 years even, right, we've had the, the big movement around Black Lives Matter, and then the other big movement in the United States has been the whole movement around Bernie Sanders, right? And 
and that movement is really a movement against what we can call neoliberalism, right? And we have a story of neoliberalism on the, on the kind of white left, if you like, in the United States and in, in Europe that um, kind of sees the 1970s as this turning point, right, where an older kind of idea of the welfare state gets dismantled and we move to, you know, the kind of neoliberal competitive market society. And that's understood in the prevailing accounts. That's understood as um, a story about um, essentially class inequality inside countries like the United States and Britain. But what that misses out is that if you actually look at the neoliberal intellectuals and neoliberal think tanks, they were um, at least as concerned um, with um, decolonization, like the, the anti-colonial movements around the world that were basically breaking down an older um, international order that was centered on European colonialism and um, uh, and also they, the neoliberals were concerned about what it meant that there was a, a black freedom movement in the United States that was also kind of breaking down a certain kind of older order, right? And um, and so central to the neoliberal project, although it's not usually recognized in our stories that we tell about it, central to the neoliberal project is this attempt to, um, in that context of crisis in the 1930s, in the 1970s, I mean, to find new ways to rebuild the racial boundaries and the colonial boundaries that um, had divided the world um, in, in that older order, right? And, and that's just, you know, a part of a story that gets left out. So yeah, so in order to in order to see that, we need to see that there were these radical alternatives that were being put forward, um, you know, through the mid twentieth century into the nineteen seventies from third world movements, um, not just about liberating their countries from um, European rule, but also you know trying to think about what a new international economic order might look like. So thinking about that history of the decolonial moments and particularly the kind of world making potential that you read within that, I think that there's a fantastic. Um, uh, project that the, the book manages to execute where it manages to combine this global vision of what the world order could look like with a very um, kind of intimate and personal story as well. Um, you know, you talk a lot about your grandfathers and their role within the decolonial moment and how that informs your analysis. Um, could you tell the audience a little bit more about the kind of personal part of the book and also how you feel that that works with the critique of the identitarian elements of liberal anti-racism that you obviously push at the, in the overall thesis. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I do spend some time in the book talking about um, the story of my grandfather who was, who was a Dutch Catholic who ended up in, um, in a Nazi concentration camp um, we don't know exactly why, but most probably because um, he was helping Jews who were in hiding and so on. But that story enables a connection to um, to actually what that same camp is is doing today, um, where it's a, a kind of uh, still being used as a prison and, and specifically has a unit that is part of the kind of war on terror detention system for, for of detaining Muslims who are considered extremists. So there's a way that that story that person that story that I have a personal connection to does opens up um, these kind of connections that I think are central to the book's argument, right, about about how these different struggles are uh, imbricated together. Um, and then in terms of my father, who was, you know, to some extent involved in the in the anti-colonial movements in, in Sindh, in, in South Asia, where, where he came from, um, you know, it's a similar way of thinking about how the the personal story is a starting point, right? That's the stuff I grew up with, right? That's the that's the the kind of stories that that shape me around the kitchen table or whatever. Um, but the the personal is is always going to be your starting point. But you know where you go with that is what matters, and and how you then make the connections between where you're positioned and your personal history to build outwards to to think about um, broader struggles and building up collective. Um, so. You know, yes, the argument of the book is is that um, anti-racism can't be a matter of changing individuals, right? It has to be about dismantling structures of power um, and building new kinds of structures. But um, that doesn't mean to say that we aren't all shaped by those structures, and and that's our that's our you know, as I say, as the personal is a starting point, but not an end point. Whilst the kind of liberal anti-racism tradition sees the personal as the end point, would you say, looks for you to kind of understand the world just through your own personal trauma? Exactly. And that's, you know, I think that's that's its great limitation is that it, it imagines that if only we could just 
gradually persuade enough people not to be racist or figure out how to get rid of these unconscious biases that are somewhere in our minds that then somehow everything else would fall into place. Prisons, um, you know, deportation centers, police would all just disappear into the internet. Right, right. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the obvious problem with that is um, you, you give your, di you know, give your uh, immigration officer all the diversity awareness training you want they're still going to deport you they'll just deport you politely right <laughs> because they know not to use certain words and so on right so you know why do deportations happen it's not because deportation officers are prejudiced or in fact it's not even because there's a certain number of prejudiced people in society it's because the the system of racial capitalism that we live under requires there to be a system of immigration enforcement to maintain certain kinds of racial divisions of labor around the world so we've got a grapple with that part of the problem um, rather than um, thinking that we can fix this through um, you know through thinking about unconscious biases and so on so another thing I think that's that's really interesting in the book is the way that you profile some of these um, less known significant figures from history and you know I think one of the major characters in the book that we can touch upon is a trap Brown could you tell us a little bit more about um, who that was and why you decided to, to study yeah, so so A. Trap Brown was one of the leaders of the um, Black Power movement in the late 1960s in the United States. He grew up uh, in Louisiana and then became involved in in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, kind of working in Alabama, Mississippi. And um, he um, becomes a chair of SNCC in 1967 and pretty much from that moment onwards is um, getting criminalized in various ways by by um, you know the FBI and the other kind of agencies in the United States. But um, there's two things that I think are really significant about him. So one is that in, um, in 1969, he puts out a book um, that is kind of like a, polit a political memoir that is pretty remarkable for someone who was, what, 26, year old, 26 years old when he was writing it. Um, and um, it kind of tells a story of how he, how he ended up being this kind of well-known leader of the Black Power Movement. Uh, but in the last third of the book, he kind of lays out an account of how he sees um, racism working in the United States at that time and where it's heading. And um, in particular, how racism and capitalism are kind of how they sit together. Right. And so he's, what he's doing is really doing what we would now call something like a theory of racial capitalism. Right. And um, and his argument is, you know, like um, uh at, at this moment in the late 1960s, the kind of the thing that is going on is that because of changes in the in the way that the capitalist economy is working, like deindustrialization and so on, which is already starting to kick in, um, black labor is not going to be needed, right? And and so black Americans who brought to the United States as slaves for their labor are suddenly going to be in this situation where their labor is not needed. What does that mean politically and socially and so on? What he's saying is, is that that is going to be a dangerous situation because although it looks like we're in this moment in the late 60s of kind of liberal progress, we've got the civil rights legislation, we're talking about racial integration and so on. He's saying, no, look at the, look at the, economic, uh, look at the, the economic situation here and, what, and how that and what the racial elements are to that. And you're looking at... Um, uh, a, 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 there's going to be an attempt to eliminate this population that is no longer needed for its labour, right? Um, because according to him, that's what capitalism will do when when it finds itself confronted by a surplus population, as you would put it, right? So, um, and he predicts that they're going to build camps and put black people in camps, which is in a way exactly what happens, right? Like that's that's the story of mass incarceration that he's anticipating that is then going to you know, run through the following decades, right? And so, so you know, looking back on that, it's it's remarkable that he's anticipated it, but also it's remarkable that um, he's giving us an account there of how you can understand racism, not as some sort of thing that's um, just always there in modernity in the background, you know, kind of um, always the same, but something that is shaped very much through the specific relationship to capitalism at that moment, right? And so I think that's that's interesting that that comes from him. And then the other thing is um, we forget that, you know, so many of these figures from that moment, the Black Power leaders, the Black Panthers and so on, are still with us and, and often in prison. And, and H. Rep. Brown or Jamil Alamine, as he's now renamed himself, he converted to Islam in 1971, is um, in a federal prison in Tucson, right? And, and so those, you know, those struggles that he was involved in in the late 60s and the attempts to... to um, 
to clamp down on those struggles coming from from um, government agencies, that moment um, has run right through to today. Right, he's still he's still struggling, and he's still in in um, you know facing criminalization. Right, and so I think. When you look at it like that, it changes the sort of timeline that we have in our heads, right? It's not like there was this heroic moment of struggle in the late 60s and then, you know, various things were done to squash that and then we've kind of left with the aftermath. It's like, actually, no, there's been a, a constant process of a struggle and, and, re and response to it. No. And thinking about, you know, A. Trap Brown's analysis of racial capitalism, you know, which really is anchored upon this idea of, you know, like kind of surplus populations being created through the change in dynamics of capital production. Um, how do you translate that to, you know, the current hyper digitalized global economy in which, you know, surplus populations are being created everywhere you know what do you think is real the value of reading people like a trap brown today right my i think you know if you look at what neoliberalism has done i mean since the 1970s around the world it has uprooted you know millions and millions of people from pre-existing livelihoods and then been unable to integrate them into new forms of viable living right and so there are you know huge populations of the world around the world who um who would love to be exploited in waged labor in the way that you know is described in in Marx's Capital Volume One? You know that would be a that would be a, a something that they would like to be able to access, but they're actually not even able to get to that level of exploitation. They're, they're considered a kind of disposable humanity, right? And so, um, I think I think um, when we think about, and and you know the key thing here is that is that neoliberalism racializes that relationship, right? So it, it, it understands those surplus populations as somehow racially um, fail, failing to um, engage in, in what a neoliberal economy should look like, right? It's their failure to be entrepreneur, entrepreneurial enough, uh, their failure to have the right cultural values to, to be able to succeed in this, in this competitive market, right? And so, um, uh, and, and what does neoliberalism do then is it, it creates various infrastructures of violence to, to manage those populations it builds borders to make sure that they don't come into the places where they might be able to access um, a different kind of life and a different kind of labor market. Um, uh, it it launches wars like the war on terror, the war on drugs, to um, to to uh, to effectively you know, carry out um, uh, mass violence against these peoples, right? And so, um, I think I think that is the part of the story of neoliberalism that we often leave out on the left. Um, and I think it, you know, what it means is, is, as well, is if we if we think about those those peoples, their struggles are not going to look like the kind of classic model of what the of what we think about of as um, left struggle in in the kind of European tradition. It's not about they don't have the option of withdrawing their labour as a way to get some leverage over capitalism, right? So their struggles are going to look different. They're going to um, we're going to have to tell a different story about what their anti-capitalism might look like. Excellent, excellent, and you know, in that last answer you touched upon this relationship between Marx and traditional understandings of capitalism and the history of anti-colonialism you know what do you think that those two traditions offer to each other how do they speak to each other so you know I think we can to, to kind of grapple with that we can look at um, this moment in uh, 1920 when we have this debate going on between um, Lenin on the one hand and MN Roy on the other hand um, which I write about in the book and I think is a really interesting moment where the two of them are kind of trying to think through the, the question of how does um, the struggle, the class struggle in Europe um, relate to anti-colonial struggles um, around the world and um, there's a couple of things to say. So firstly, um, Lenin is someone who is you know the conventional narrative that we have on the left is you know 1917 the russian revolution is all about class struggle 1968 the sort of is presented as a sort of cultural revolution in the west when we start to talk about race and gender and sexuality and so on right um but actually if you look more closely lenin is talking about race in in the discussions in 1920 that he's having around the question of colonialism because he sees things like white supremacy in the united states as um as, as a national liberation struggle, right? Um, in the same way that anti-colonial struggles elsewhere are. So 
um, the question of how, you know, the question of what we might now think of as intersectionality, the question of how race and class are kind of like, um, how do we bring together those two two aspects of struggle is right there in those discussions, right? And what Lenin is is arguing is that the role of anti-colonialism is kind of secondary, right? He's, he's like, basically, in order for you to have a successful revolution, you're going to have to um, have an industrial working class that has... Um, uh, a kind of modernized culture and a um you know a professional political leadership of a vanguard and um uh mn roy is is saying well no actually there's there's um there's revolutionary possibilities outside of that lenin accepts that but thinks that the the most that can come from an anti-colonial struggle is a kind of spark that might that might lead to a revolution in Europe, whereas Roy is like, no, there's going to be revolutions elsewhere. There's going to be revolutions in India. There's going to be revolutions in Mexico and so on, right? And and I think you know Roy probably turns out to be more accurate in terms of his predictions in the 20th century, where where you do see re more revolutions happening outside Europe than than within. Mm, good point. Um, so thinking about um, some of the, the the targets of criticism that you focus on in the book, um, particularly, you know, the kind of anti-racist liberal initiatives that have emerged over the last five years, unconscious bias training, diversity initiatives. Um, now, I think that you make the, the, the very well-argued point that they don't attack the kind of structural basis of either racism or capitalism. Um, but I wondered if you could explain a little bit why they seem to inspire so much fear and so much panic in the right wing media, you know, across the West at the moment, if they are so ultimately useless. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think for conservatives, um, they run together everything that looks like anti-racism. Right. Um, they don't distinguish. Um, and to some extent, liberals don't distinguish either. Right. Like they, they don't recognize a more radical alternative to their own form of anti-racism. So both liberals and conservatives kind of agree on that, that there's only one kind of anti-racism and it looks like, you know, unconscious bias training, diversity, representation and so on, right? Like getting Hollywood movies to reflect the, the, the you know, the populations of the United States. So um, I, I think I think conservatives um, are... are basically taking their cue from liberals there and saying that, that okay so if this is what anti-racism is this is what we oppose right um uh i think that um we need to you know by distinguishing between the two different kinds of anti-racism actually changes the debate on on how this looks um because i think that you know what gives the conservative critique of anti-racism some kind of core of of plausibility is the fact that they're right in a way that that liberal anti-racism is kind of patronizing, right? It does look down on on people as uneducated. It looks down on people who on lower incomes as somehow more likely to be racist and so on, right? While ignoring the you know the very powerful people who who maintain a racially divided world, right? So I think there's a there's a you know if we don't make a clear distinction between liberal anti-racism and the more radical alternatives, we hand to conservatives an easy attack line. Um, where they can, with some plausibility, say that that you know this anti-racism stuff is just a, a way of bashing poor white people over the head. Um, uh, whereas from the radical anti-racist point of view, I mean, we might despair at the kind of historic um, failure of a lot of white workers to ally with other workers around the world, but we understand that the real opponents that we have as as radical anti-racists is is. The, the capitalist ruling class and the people at the top of the of the system who who maintain this world, so you know I think that's why um, uh, a core argument for me is is let's let's like highlight that distinction and separate ourselves from the liberal anti racists True, true. But I just wondered, like, wouldn't the you know wouldn't the conservatives, as part of that ruling class, not see some of these anti-racist initiatives as you know a fantastic way to mask the actual structural inequalities that persist underneath you know you wonder why they don't champion yeah diversity initiative get a you know a couple of you know bme executives on the on the board and then all of a sudden you can continue to have a globally exploitative company you know <laughs> destroying resources in the global south um whilst you can say look we, we're we're diverse i wonder why there's still a portion of that particular camp that is so uncomfortable with yeah. these initiatives that could often end up masking um, 
the persistence of both racial and cap- and economic inequality. Yeah. No, I mean, I think there's a there's a split, you know, in the, in in the ruling elites, right, among amongst themselves as, as to the best way to think through this stuff around race. You know, so um, one, you know, the conservative camp thinks that you will need um, to to maintain a certain sense of of whiteness, a certain sense of the you know the power of that, of a certain idea of cultural homogeneity, and so, so on. Right, they see it all and as a sliding scale. Right, right, and that's and that, that those things are still essential to to being able to rule the world. Um, whereas on the other hand, you have liberals who are imagining a way of ruling the world that kind of you know allows for this sort of certain notion of elite diversity, right? And so mm. there's a debate there, and actually. I'm not sure where the conservatives are on this sometimes because a lot of the time they are doing exactly that stuff, even as they attack, you know, critical race theory and, and attack, uh, uh, you know, kind of what they call anti-racism. At the same time, they, they'll they jump at the chance to um, put a black face on their politics for for exactly the, you know, with exactly that motive of, of saying, well, look how diverse we are, right? So there's these contradictions. But I think basically there's a, you know, there's a sort of disagreement, there's a sort of uh, difference of opinion amongst the ruling elites themselves over how to move forward, you know, and, and maintain their power um, and where race fits into that. The final thing that I really want to get your thoughts on is that the book obviously has a very global scope, um, you know, that it touches upon anti-colonial struggles from all different continents and of course is very expansive in its historical perspective but also I think uh, the primary target audience for the book is probably the American um, post-2020 um, Black Lives Matter um, moment where the kind of yeah um, corporate anti-racism that you critique really reaches the apotheosis you know that's where the biggest Nike deals are being signed yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what would you say that a kind of British readership or readerships in other um, jurisdictions can really take from that, um, especially when you think about a lot of the people that you really cite as um, as part of that 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 chronology of radical anti-racism yeah. are people who have a relationship to um, British anti-racism and the British anti-colonial struggle. Your C.L.R. Jameses, your um, Cedric Robertsons, your Stuart Halls. Um, talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, transatlantic conversation that you are exploring in the book. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, the the book tries to start from a certain moment in the United States, right? But then, if, to really understand that and to understand the histories that have led up to that, it, inevitably, I think you end up um, going outside the United States, right? And one of the places you're going to go to is Britain. One of the places you're going to go to is South Africa. Um, these you know, struggles in those places have ended up through particular journeys that individuals have made and so on, have ended up being substantial influences in how radical anti-racism looks in the United States, right? So you, you need to do those journeys in order to, in order to just tell the US story. Um, and in doing so, you end up, I think, also um, telling a story that, that's as much about Britain as it is about the United States. Um, and, you know, we have a situation in Britain, and when we think about anti-racism in Britain, a lot of the time it's it's heavily shaped by things that are happening in the United States, vocabularies that come from the United States, um, ways of thinking that come from the United States. Um, and we don't see our own history in Britain. Um, at the same time, we don't see that... Um, uh, what we think of as American is actually also not purely American, but something that has has um, been made in Britain, right? Um, by by people who've come from South Asia and Africa and the Caribbean and so on, right? And so, um, you know, when you think about Cedric Robinson, whose important work is done in Britain, um, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, um, when you think about C.L.R. James, right, who's moving across um, uh, in various ways across the Atlantic through the late 20th century, um, uh, and countless other figures. Mm. Do you think that there is a kind of a, a, a warning element towards um, other jurisdictions in the book of the way in which liberal anti-racism has been so triumphant in the US in the kind of post-George Floyd moment and, you know, with, you know, like, it, can you see a future where in Britain anti-racism means, you know, big sports stars, big corporate deals, you know, um, primarily judged upon its success for the most lucrative members in our society. Yeah, I think, you know, I don't, I don't think it's simply a matter of 
the United States kind of being further down the road on this stuff. I think Britain has its own kind of dynamic that, you know, does its own thing. But I think I think for people in Britain, looking at what's happening in the United States can have a kind of clarifying role because it kind of, in a way, sh lets you see these things in sharper relief. Um, uh, the, the same things are happening here, but perhaps not as, as um, in not a hard edged as way. Um, so, so I think there's a way in which you know we can learn something about Britain actually just through looking at how parallel things are happening in the United States as well. Fantastic. We could also learn a lot from reading your book, What is Anti-Racism? Thank you again for being in conversation with me, Arun. Thanks very much, Kojo.